Morning, buddy. All right. Hey, Kate. Well, uh, we'll introduce everybody here in a second. I'm trying to figure out the best way to uh, do this. I think that's a that's probably a better layout right there. I'm gonna have to move my head down a little bit or something. Though. Um, I'll, I'll figure it out here in a minute. So, welcome everybody. We are selecting some barrels. That's right, barrels with an S of Old Elk tonight, and we're gonna be doing. And this is a reason why we're doing this is because. Last year, we had Greg on, and we selected a barrel, and he had this thing. Greg called it the Nog. Greg, what did the Nog stand for? Uh, that is uh, Nectar of the Gods. There you go. So oh. Nectar of the Gods. Yeah. And, the best uh, of the best. So we, we chose the barrel, and we called it the Notorious NOG. A little, <laughs> little, little spin on Big Pop over there. And uh, it sold out in within a day. Wow. And so we said, you know what? This time we're not gonna we're not gonna risk it. We're gonna do two barrels this time, so we can yeah. try to spread the love around as much as possible. It was a good one. Very it was. Cool. It was fantastic. So, uh, you know me, you know Ryan, and then we have another member of the team on here tonight. We got Shem since he's got some samples. So Shem, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Hello, sir. Hello. And then uh, and before we get to Dave and Cody, uh, we actually you know we had Greg on. Last time we did a barrel selection, Greg's also been on the podcast before. He came and talked to us back when uh, it's had been maybe two or three years now since we had you on. And we we got to know a little bit about your time at MGP and what you were doing there. And you kind of we kind of tailed off. And this was kind of when Old Elk was just starting and kind of getting off the ground. And so we kind of got a little hint at what you were getting into. So glad to have you back here. Oh, with absolute privilege and uh you know you guys have always been big supporters of old elk and uh really it's a thrill to be here and been looking forward to it for a long time so yeah well awesome awesome and then uh and you got is it your protege kate what do you want to go by here like come on like i i gotta this is the first time that we've we've actually had a chance to talk so go ahead and introduce yourself well i'm just a simple distiller um, but no so i'm the head distiller for old elk um, so I run the operations here in town, uh, do a lot of the blends and everything, get to work with Greg on blends, on mash bills, on making our distillery here in town more efficient. Um, so I just try and soak up as much knowledge as I can from the master. Uh, she's being very humble as uh, she's a drunk and maybe I'm the Brady, but I'm going to throw her a pass and, <laughs> and she's going to run with it not too long from now. So That's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> good timing on it too. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Kate, we're glad you're here. And, and by the way, Greg and Kate, thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening to be able to spend time with us. I know it's, it's always fun to do these things in person. Plus you get to be there during the day, during working hours. And, uh, you know, thank you to your significant others. If they're there to be able to say, you know, taking time away from family to be able to be here and be with us. So we definitely appreciate it. Yeah. So glad to be here. Yep. And then, uh, and so we've got two other people that are supporters of us. And so you might be wondering like, Oh, who's, who's this Cody? Who's this Dave guy? So, this all happens because of people that help support the podcast on Patreon. We do hey, last year, we did 40 barrel selections last year. And I mean, it was almost, God, we're almost hitting like a barrel selection a week. It seemed like, but you know, because of this, you know, we, we have a great private barrel program and being a part of it, you get an opportunity to actually come and select barrels with us. So I want to welcome Cody and Dave, but Cody, I'll, I'll let you give a, an introduction yourself, a uh, little bit about yourself and you know where you're from. Yeah, I'm Cody. Um, thank you all for the opportunity. Looking forward to this. Um, my first tasting like this, I'm really excited. And I'm actually just down the road from you guys in Colorado Springs, so okay. not too far. Um, and went to school up in Fort Collins. So Go Rams. Go Rams, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, definitely, like I said, just excited and looking forward to it. Oh, cool. Glad awesome. to have you here. Have you done a barrel pick before? I have not, no. Plenty of uh, self-administered blind tastings. <laughs> so this is my first barrel pick. 
Awesome. Fantastic. The nice thing about virtually, you don't have to worry about getting canceled with ice, you know, like <laughs> one tomorrow. So Yeah, uh, that's that's a day before we get to you, I'll, I'll kind of give some some color to that. So we're supposed to be selecting another barrel tomorrow at Limestone Branch and picking a Yellowstone barrel. And right now there is uh, sleeting rain coming down in Kentucky. And so everything is closed. And so they were like, well, you know, you could try to come tomorrow, but we might be closed. And I'm like, well, let's just go ahead and cancel it. Please just give me an answer. Yeah, I know. It was, it was an a hour and a half and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. So it was, a, it was a little wishy-washy, if you will. Yeah, because they're like, we've already canceled our 130 for today, but tomorrow might be different. And, I was, and it's hard, you know, as doing this on a national level, we had somebody flying in from Baltimore. We have people driving in from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And I was just like, we've got to come up with an answer soon. So hope fingers crossed. We've actually rescheduled for Friday, but it'll actually happen. If not, we'll be looking at a later date. Anyway, enough about inside baseball knowledge. You probably don't care about, but uh, Dave, welcome to uh, the pick as well. Thank you very much. I'm uh, up here on the border of Wisconsin and Illinois and Northern Illinois from the, the town where cheap trick is from Rockford. Oh, boy. Anybody's old enough to know the band Cheap Trick, but <laughs> oh, we all know oh, yeah. it. <laughs> now I might not know the whole discography, but <laughs> yeah. my parents know it. <laughs> I, see, I, see, I see those guys driving around town every once in a while, and you know it's kind of interesting. Sitting here about four degrees, so uh, ice storms uh, sounds actually better. <laughs> <laughs> no, great. Yeah. Well, at least we got whiskey to warm us up warm here a little up. bit. That's yeah. right. Uh, Dave, is this your first barrel pick? I've done a couple. Good. Uh, accompanied my wife, who's a bourbon woman, on one of theirs and uh, and uh, did another one uh, as well. There you go. Shout out to Peggy and Maggie and all bourbon women out there. So good organization. So to kind of let everybody know what we're doing, as I'd mentioned, we've got Old Elk and we have two. We're going to be selecting two of the straight wheat whiskeys. Since we loved these so much last year, we said we're going to do them. We're going to do two this year. And it's, uh, since Dave, you're a pro at this now, uh, and Cody, this is your first time. You know, we always kind of let people know there's really no right or wrong way to do this. But typically, what we'll do is at least what I like to do is uh, I'll pour everything in glasses and then go through and nose them first. And that kind of gives you an indication of you know what you kind of like on a nose because that, if you start nosing and drinking, you're kind of mixing up some of the sensory uh, components into it. And Kate's you probably going to uh, correct. Me. Yeah, you should let Greg and Kate do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the, wait, wait a minute. Whatever this is... way you guys like to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, don't let the peasant podcasters give uh, tasting advice. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. Uh, so what I've done is I've put six glasses in front of me with, I'm sure everybody has six samples, right? Okay. You should. <laughs> Step one completed. <laughs> we're, we're good there. Um, I think I'm counting six. Yeah. Well, you might be counting 12 by the end of it. <laughs> and so uh, I've lined them all up in sequential order from 909, 931. These are barrel numbers, by the way, for you not paying attention. 939, 956. I'm... You all can see how good I am at math. 972 and then 973. You can read. Yes. And whoever wrote it, they had good handwriting. I, I didn't have to. Well, guess sometimes too much. it's easy with our distillers. <laughs> it was the distillers that is, is that what you said who pull it and read it? Yep. So we pull all our samples, filter it, and then bottle in small bottles. Um, and sometimes when we're doing a ton, our handwriting gets a little sloppy. So, uh, is it because you're sipping as you're pulling? Is that why? <laughs> you know, every once in a while, you got to do some sensory. You have to do quality <laughs> checks yeah. all along the way. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. It's going to be a good and, jump start. To and the these, are, these are all six years, which if I remember last year, Ryan, wasn't ours last year a five year? No, nope, it's a six. I'm looking at it. Oh, it was a six? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that one's so good too. Always always pull it out like when somebody that I know they like whiskey and they haven't like tried it yet. I'm like, you gotta try this. And I won't tell them what it is. They're like, holy cow, it's so good. It, also that sticker on that bottle that you guys <laughs> yeah. got was 
perfect. <laughs> that was inspired. <laughs> Shout out to pick that one out. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Dave, our, our sticker person. A different Dave, but yes, Dave Payne. Oh boy. And then we've also got uh, 40, 42 people watching us live right now. So if anybody that's watching, if you have questions and you want to pick one of the great master distillers of this world and break his brain about anything, feel free to put it in the chat. And Absolutely, we'll, yeah. We'll see if we can play Stump the Chump here. Any and all questions, bring them on. Yeah. Yep. I, love, I love talking the talk, so. There you go. Stump I was going to say, Greg, does this ever get old for you? It, you know what? It really doesn't. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm actually in the, my 42nd year, and, uh, you know, it's – it, it's it's a family, I, I, you know. The whole whiskey world is a family. As, as much as we're all competitors, uh, you know, on a day to day basis, uh, at the end of the day, we're also family, and uh, it's it's really uh, a unique thing about the business is that you can. There's room for everybody, and everybody sort of treats it that way. So it's it's really pretty. It's pretty special when it comes to something like that, and and every day there's something to learn. I would never proclaim to learn to tell you that I know everything about the business because I don't, but uh, every day I'm willing to learn. And uh, usually every day I'm around it, I, uh, I find out uh, something else that I didn't know the day before. So it's been a, been a great, great, great business for me. That's awesome. How much time you spend in Colorado now these days? <laughs> well, uh, sadly, since the uh, coronavirus, I haven't traveled since uh, February, but the, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that really I think one of the great things that's been born uh, of the virus is uh, these virtual meetings and virtual tastings and virtual pod, uh, virtual podcasts. Uh, so you know, like from uh, right off the bat, in the end of February, March, I mean, we jumped right into the virtual arena to uh, you know substitute for the for the, uh, you know, face to face and personal, but, uh, at, at the end of the day, we can reach a lot, a lot of people, uh, easily. Uh, it's not quite the same as face to face, but it's really not bad. And, uh, I think going forward, I, I think, uh, there's going to be uh, part of the business moving forward. So, so I'm a fan of it. Been really good for me. Driving home, getting anywhere. Yeah. I'm, getting, I'm in my sweatpants right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so a lot to be said for that. And I, I am, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm an old goat, but I'm a big fan. So, <laughs> well, let's hope you have pants on, Ryan. We can't, we can't tell. I'm not standing there. No camera checks. That's all right. It's the the COVID uniform. <laughs> yeah. You know, I saw the old elk emblem in the right corner. I was like, "Dang, Shim's got an old elk thing in his." <laughs> I ball. got the same too. I was, <laughs> I was like, like "Where wow. did I get one of those?" Uh, like, he went all out. I didn't know. <laughs> I, I, I got the uh, the white linen uh, uh, blinds, and and Kenny's got the logo there. It's perfect. Yeah, it worked out. Oh, no, great. it looks like it's perfectly on there. That's awesome. <laughs> So as we go through this, uh, you know, I've always said that this is your event and not mine. Uh, and I always uh, like to just to be here to support. But, uh, you know, I, I, is everybody familiar with the mash bill uh, that we're looking at today? Let's uh, go ahead and go teach everybody. Again, uh, again this, this uh, uh, just to give you a, a little background and a little history, if you don't, if you're not uh, totally familiar with Old Elk or even totally familiar with me and, and, and Kate, but, uh, you know, essentially I've been in the business for 42 years. Uh, I spent 38 years of that at uh, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, at the big distillery there. Uh, went through, uh, I started out under the Seagram umbrella for about 24 years, uh, and then we were sold and became Pernod Car for about seven years. And then we became LDI for a period of about four and a half years, which is really when that distillery became 100% uh, contract distillers. And then after uh, four and a half years of that, and uh, then we became MGP. And I worked uh, for MGP for about three and a half years. And then uh, subsequently uh, had an invite from Old Elk to become their full-time master distiller. And uh, literally, it was a no-brainer. But uh, the the short, long 
story is that I actually met Old Elk about seven years ago <clears throat> while I was still master distiller at MGP. Uh, at that point, doing 100, 100% contract distilling for uh, many, many folks under many, many different brand names. But the, uh, the the really unique thing about Old Elk when they came to the take, came to the plant was that uh, Old Elk really wanted custom mash bills. They didn't want the the uh, the, the four or five uh, different mash bills that we were producing for everybody else. And uh, literally, that was the first time in my career to actually have the ability to craft uh, custom mash bills from the ground up unrestricted. And when I say unrestricted, I, I, I really mean from a, uh, a financial standpoint. Uh, the first one that they uh, asked me to create was actually the uh, Old Elk Bourbon mash bill which was uh, an extremely high malted barley content mash bill. And uh, that was really uh, derived from, from two terms that they gave me to work with. They said they wanted that product to be smooth and easy. And after we uh, went ahead and uh, crafted that and produced it, uh, Old Elk came back and said that, you know, we had sort of a round table discussion. And again, that, this is seven years ago. And, and they're saying, you know, what what do you think will be the next big thing six or seven years down the road? And, you know, that's really literally where we're at right this minute. And as we talked, uh, you know, at that time, rye whiskey was was uh, really gaining traction and becoming super popular. But uh, uh, also at that time, uh, the, the weeded bourbon and the weeded whiskey markets were really pretty much untapped. I mean, there were uh, several brands out there that had very nice products, but, but largely uh, it was an untapped market. And as we talked, uh, we, we sort of decided that, uh, you know, we wanted to do a weeded bourbon and a weeded whiskey, but we wanted to, uh, we wanted to go to the extreme end of those mash bills. Everybody else in the market was probably at the lower end of the weeded content. So in this particular case, the uh, the wheat whiskey, we went 95% wheat, 5% malt, which is way at the other end of the, uh, the wheat spectrum. It's wheat spectrum relative to the mash bill. And, uh, you know, I like to call it the real McCoy of a wheat whiskey. And it was really derived from... Uh, everything I learned about making the famous 95% rye, 5% malt mash bill that, that we produced down, uh, down there in Lawrenceburg, Indiana for, for many, many years. And uh, strangely enough, uh, uh, the rye whiskey, that 95% rye, 5% malt mash bill is, uh, from a technical aspect, is very, very difficult to produce and have the quality uh, come out as a world-class quality product. And it turns out that the wheat has many of the same uh, attributes from a grain standpoint that makes it uh, very similar and very difficult to produce as well. So uh, I was able to leverage uh, everything that I had learned uh, uh, at that Lawrenceburg distillery on how to produce uh, those difficult mash bills and, and applied it to what we're looking at tonight. So. Uh, it, it's a mash bill that, uh, again, it's, it's a real McCoy uh, wheat whiskey. It's 95% wheat, 5% malt. Uh, it's very difficult to produce uh, from the technical perspective uh, and, and have the quality come out the way it does. So, uh, uh, you know, for, for many reasons, I'm very proud of what we've done here and uh, really anxious to hear your feedback on uh, what we're looking at tonight. So you this make, is uh, Kate try to make the ninety five rye. That's like her goat. You got to you got to test and or the, in the weed <laughs> mash bill, like you make that without screwing up your end. Well, she actually did one up. She did. She did a hundred percent rye. She's doing one hundred percent rye out, out there in Fort Collins. So uh, she's she's a fast learner, no doubt. Yeah, it's really fun because you know with with Greg being on kind of as a mentor originally, we started in Fort Collins with just, um, you know, playing with recipes and getting to really explore different yeasts and different 
mash bills. And so we found um, the rye whiskey that we're making here in Fort Collins is actually, um, it's like 90, 93% raw rye. And then there's caramel rye and which is a malted rye and then a standard malted rye as well. Um, but Greg is not lying when he says that rye is very difficult to make. Um, I have had to call him a few times with issues, but um, we love getting to do what we do. So what we're tasting is the what we would call the the other 95.5. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yes, sir. That's I like that. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, the other white meat, you know, or the other red meat kind of whatever. The that's other 95.5. This tastes like nothing I've ever tried. And I, I drink a lot of high rye rye. And this is crazy. Way different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the wheat whiskey is really fun because wheat is such a different grain. You know, it brings off such a different flavor profile. You know, is really you can really see some of the congeners that the fermentation process makes. So it's a really fun one, it really is. I think what you'll find also is that you may you may see things in this product that you haven't seen in maybe a rye or even a bourbon, and, and the reason is that uh, it, uh, from a, a high corn content bourbon mash bill. Uh, the corn brings a lot of the robust characteristics uh, to the bourbon table. And because of that, it has a tendency to mask uh, other congeners that are in there, uh, which would be brought to the table through, uh, you know, a rye or a, or a wheat or some other cereal grain. But when you get a, when you get a, a very uh, high content of wheat, in this case, and, and a zero content of corn, uh, you're getting to really see uh, what we can bring to the table relative to a mash bill. And it may be things that you haven't seen before. And that, I, I can't tell you whether that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, it's certainly going to be different than, uh, you know, uh, what you may have seen in the, in the past. We like different. Yeah, Kate, here's a question for you that came up. If you have issues with stuck mash at all when you deal with the wheat. I know I've seen it before with rye because it's super sticky. <laughs> rye is super sticky. So I think that wheat is a little easier to work with. Um, so we don't see quite as many stuck fermentations. Um, we'll actually add a few extra enzymes just in case to make sure we kind of avoid that. Um, the the rye is probably definitely the hardest because it does get super viscous. That time that I, I had to, you know, look down and be like, ah, what's happening? Was the mash was so viscous or the wash was so viscous that the heat transfer in the still wasn't super efficient. And so it was freaking the still out. And so it was just blowing steam out the back. And it was a hot mess. And thank God we learned from that. <laughs> I got a question. Uh, does altitude make a difference like when distilling or anything with that? I know it like on my smoker, it says like if you're a different altitude, you need to cook it at a higher, different temperature. Mm -hmm. Is the same thing with distilling? Yeah. So your boiling temperature is going to be different. Um, the aging process is also a little bit different just because um, the atmospheric pressure is different. And so it's going to affect the barrel a little differently. Um, so we have a few, it's, we make a few adjustments um, from, you know, like bringing um, the recipes that Greg has made into Fort Collins will sometimes tweak a few things or maybe it's the entry proof that we're tweaking just to make sure that we're getting a similar taste profile. Awesome. So has everybody started uh, tasting through, at least at least tasted through them once? Kind of oh, like, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm on number five. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm just making sure we're I'm slow playing. Sorry. We're, yeah, it's okay. I know it's it's great to have to have Greg and Kate answer all these questions, and we just get to drink and hang out. That's usually we're <laughs> yeah. the ones like trying to like keep a conversation going, make this lively. I mean, people want to watch and just watch a bunch of silence of people drinking. So yeah, <laughs> keep something going here. <laughs> I got a question for Kate. Uh, are you column stills out in Fort Collins, or are you uh, are you pot still? Um, so we have a really great Carl still right now that we can actually do both. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a pot that we can adjust just to go from the pot to the condenser, or we have two columns in between that if we want to run things through a column, we can. Um, but right now, typically, we're just doing double pot distillation here in town. So but we do also have a really great column still waiting for us at a 
a new facility once we get that up and running. But it did get delivered to Fort Collins the other day, and yeah. it's beautiful. I imagine these were produced on a column, right, Greg? Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. It's a okay. traditional uh, continuous beer still and doubler arrangement. Okay. Awesome. I was like, whatever y'all are doing, I'm just like, uh, I'm putting putting some check boxes, putting some lines next to the ones that I like when I want to move forward. So we'll uh, we'll kind of give it a, a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll actually we'll give it like another 10 minutes and then we'll try to start narrowing it down to like at least three and then we'll try to narrow it down to two more after that. Yeah, also, I, I saw a question from Brian. Does heat of mixing affect flavor? Yeah. So, oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. it does. <laughs> Um, so this is actually something that um, I introduced to Old Elk when we were getting ready to launch our bourbon. Um, I realized I've never done this before. So I wanted to get, you know, a little bit more information. I'm kind of a nerd that way. And I went to a conference and learned about how adding water at a slower rate can help keep the quality of your whiskey. But we didn't go too far into it, but it, it really stuck with me. So as soon as I got back to Fort Collins, I started playing. And it's amazing how vastly different a, a spirit is if you add all of the water at once because it's an exothermic reaction. It's producing heat. Um, and it can actually burn off the flavor compounds that we've just waited so long for to you know, exist in a barrel um, that we actually do a, a process called slow cutting um, so we add a little bit of water at a time. That way we reduce the amount of heat produced during that mixing process. Um, and it really makes a huge difference with mouthfeel, with keeping all of the nuanced congeners in the bottle. Um, so yes, it totally does affect it. The single barrels, we're actually not proofing down, so they are at cast strength, but um, any of our standard proofed products has that slow cut process in. Gotcha. Nice. And what's your background, Kate? Oh yeah, definitely. Or, uh, old Elk. Um, before Old Elk, I was a student at Colorado State University. Go Rams! Uh, Rams. Go Rams! Rams. Yes, I like, go Rams. Um, so I actually have a degree in fermentation science and technology. So I thought I was going to go beer. That's mostly what my schooling was on. Um, Oh my gosh, that would be a good name. Um, but anyway, so I, you know, I got to brew at Odell. I got to brew it on campus. We actually have two breweries on campus now. Um, and so I definitely thought I was gonna go beer and then just kind of happenstance, found Old Elk, went through the interview process and started as an intern the Monday after graduation and totally fell in love with the whiskey making process, the maturation process, I think is fascinating. The slow cut process I learned, you know, a few years into my, my time at Old Elk. Um, but yeah, so that's my background. Got to Fort Collins and didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you originally from? Originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be the first person I've ever met from Albuquerque. Oh, really? Well, there's quite a few of us. <laughs> I think there's probably more than you there, but yeah. There's yeah, always the, you know, it, it, New Mexico is the land of uh, enchantment, but we always call it the land of entrapment because not, not too many people leave. <laughs> But I love it up here in Fort Collins. It's amazing. Awesome. Do you miss the like instant gratification of making beer? You're like, oh, I can make beer, be ready. Let's go. And whiskey, you're like, well, see you later. It was something that I had a really <laughs> hard crossed. time yeah. adjusting to. So it was the two things that I had the hardest time was was with that instant gratification and sensory. Because we were trained on sensory with like, a very neutral beer like Bud Light that we would then spike with off flavors. And then we would train on picking them up. And so when we went to, when I switched to spirits, you do sensory on this and it's a whole lot different than sensory on a beer. Um, and so it took me a little bit to get past the, the alcohol burn and really start digging into the flavor compounds. But yes, having to sit there and wait is definitely hard to do sometimes what's uh what's your all sensory greg what's your sensory training program no uh, up. Got my, no, mine was uh my background and training was uh primarily through the 24 years at seagram's uh they 
that company at the time was very progressive and extremely anal about uh, <laughs> quality. About Fair quality, uh, they and, and uh, so uh, a big part of my training was really about uh, identifying quality defects more uh, more so than uh, identifying uh, you know specific characteristics in an age discipline. So. I, w- I would say a majority of my my training was really uh, at the white distillate stage, uh, deciding whether to put it in the barrel or not put it in the barrel, and identifying all the quality defects that uh, can be associated with uh, white distillates before you put them in a barrel. Give us an example of what is something that is a, a bad quality when you're tasting a, a white distillate that you would be able to say, like, no, there's something wrong here. Yeah, well, there's uh, there's a, a very wide spectrum. Uh, probably, I would say, probably one of the worst uh, defects that uh, will not age out if you put it in the barrel it would be must, uh, and that is a grain defect. That would be uh, specifically uh, a defect from the grain that you use uh, at the start of the process. Uh, probably the next most common uh, Defect would be, uh, especially in like a rye whiskey, would be aldehydes. Uh, uh, that's aldehydes is actually part of all the f- flavor profiles and congener profiles uh, in a product. But it, if uh, if you don't ferment them correctly, uh, the yeast will get stressed and they'll way overproduce uh, those those components to the point. I'm getting some reverb, but. Uh, to the point where uh, it becomes a severe quality defect. Uh, then there's other components that uh, would be uh, sour uh, or dill, which which would be fermentation uh, defects. Um, uh, barnyard uh, is, is, is <laughs> another common. <laughs> now, literally, uh, the distillate would smell like a, a barnyard. And again, that's... I, know that. uh, no. I bet that's, you do, Bardstown. <laughs> that, that would be uh, a grain related or a fermentation related defect. So uh, there's uh, uh, quite an array of uh, different defects that, uh, that we were trained to look for before we put, put products in the barrel. <laughs> and, I'm just trying I, to think it, of like, okay, let's, let's think of like an aged product. Mm-hmm. If there's something aged and something was defective, I mean, I guess other than it just tasting terrible, like how would you, how would, is there a certain note or something you'd be like, ah, there's something off about this. I'm, I'm thinking because, oh. you know, Cody had mentioned that, you know, he likes to, you know, set up blind tastings and stuff like that for himself. Like if there was something that you could do and like, let's say, let's say you bought another distillery and some other podcast like Single Barrel Pick and you're just like, ah, this thing's terrible. Like you can pick up a defect. Like what would it be? No, it would uh, it would be must must would be would come right through. Uh, I've had some be, I've had some twenty four year old bourbons that tasted that tasted very musty. Is that it would taste does that mean they that means they were bad? <laughs> yes, absolutely. It would taste and smell like a musty basement. And, does does and that it, must come across as like a mold? Yep, sure does. Uh, hmm. it, it, and it it will not age out. So if you see that in an aged product, it went into the barrel that way. Uh, high aldehydes would be another uh, component that won't age out, and it just carries through. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, I don't know if you want to call it in secrets, but <clears throat> when you're making whiskey, uh, the distillation process really is uh, the simple part. All, all of the fermentation is is the critical and the key component in making any whiskey. That's where, that's where you're developing all the flavors. The distillation process. Uh, is simply extracting all those flavors from the fermenter and transferring them to, to the bottle. So uh, the, the distillation end is really uh, quite a bit less technical than the fermentation end. And so anything that goes into the fermenter from the get-go and anything that uh, uh, results as a, uh, uh, you know, the aftermath of fermentation, any 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 uh, flavors or, or congeners that are developed as part of that process, uh, all that is going to transfer to the bottle. So if, if you don't have good coming out of the fermenter going to the bottle, a, a barrel 
will not make uh, uh, bad whiskey better. Uh, it'll only make good whiskey better. So mm -hmm. it, that, that's a big deal. Uh, you you have you have to have quality of components going in grain water. Uh, you have to cook it correctly, and then you absolutely have to ferment it correctly uh, to to achieve a, a world class quality product at, at the end of your maturation. Uh, if I'm it's just glad yeah. I'm just saying, well, I'm glad we have the easy job and all we have to do is just drink it and select it. <laughs> so, well, that, it's kind of hard tonight. I, <laughs> the only one, like, I'm not happy with that. The other ones, I'm like, I, it's splitting hairs. So, there's a couple that are standing out to me. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah, all taste fun when I was, oh, Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. They, they all taste fairly similar to each other. You know, so it's, it's, it's tough. Well, yeah, I hope they I taste have, similar. They all are the same mash bill. They so. are all the same mash <laughs> bill. However, that's Greg the and cool Kate part. are like, yes. That's, that's the cool part about want. single barrels is yeah. you can have the same mash bill going to the same cooperage barrel aged in the same area of the warehouse, but it's all going to be a little different. You know, we've had some wheat whiskey barrels that are super like in your face spicy. You, you would swear that there's some rye in there, but it's just the barrel doing its thing. It's one of the compounds that, like, uh, say, like a wood sugar from the actual wood will get extracted into the whiskey and then react and react and react, and then you get this spice character. So, and it it depends on you know how long the the wood for the barrels was dry aged or seasoned. It depends on you know what part of the tree that wood comes from. Um, so I, I geek out really hard on our single barrel program because it's so cool to just watch the different, like see the difference, taste the difference, you know, the mouth feels are different. Um, and so I really liked getting to pick these six barrels out cause I wanted to try and give you guys a variety, um, of kind of what the mash bill will produce. Um, so I think there's, you know, some juicy ones in there. I think there's one that's a little spicy, so really looking forward to seeing what you all think of them 931 the spicy one maybe <laughs> yeah i i, I would have said, said i would have said, spicy. I said 956 was the spicy one. <laughs> oh really hmm. i'm getting a nice like mouth uh viscosity off of that 956 i love yeah, 956 too. good lord yeah i like 56 yeah where where did you guys say that, that these um um age are they aging in colorado or elsewhere they, uh, they aged uh, in uh, Lawrenceburg up till about uh, probably six months ago after, after I sampled all the barrel program all the barrel program barrels uh, I evaluate them and once they're approved uh, then, then we make arrangements to have them shipped out to Fort Collins so uh, currently uh, all the barrel program uh, barrels that are available are currently be uh, are, are aging uh, in Fort Collins, but uh, a big part of their life, uh, from the maturation standpoint, uh, was in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, I was like, your your hand must hurt because your your signature is on every single one of these bottles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I, uh, I enjoy that part of the job. I really do. <laughs> Just signing bottles all day. Yeah. Kissing hands and wait, well, I was gonna say kissing hands and shaking babies, so that's not the right way. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, but it, it is interesting. Every barrel has its own fingerprint, you know, and uh, you know, it's uh, you know, everybody's palate has its own fingerprint. So it's it's always interesting to uh, you know uh, be part of these tastings and and uh, you know watch folks pick a barrel because. Uh, you know what? What what I think is is right or wrong uh, is is entirely different, and that's that's the beauty of the business. Is there's there's no right and wrong answer. It's it's whatever you like, and, and uh, I always like to just uh, come along for the ride and, and uh, you know participate uh, as a uh, you know support group. Uh, and you know I I I've, I've always said that it's, it's your event, not mine. Uh, always happy to answer questions and and, and guide you, but it's it's uh, absolutely your choice on which one you folks like. And it's it's always quite interesting because it's uh, it's individual fingerprints that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's start narrowing this down a little bit. So I hope uh, everybody on the selection panel here, Greg, Kate, I'm going to ask you to to kind of uh, you can have your favorites, but give them to yourself, okay? And then you can you can do your reveal at the end. I, I want to make sure we Absolutely. we don't influence. Don't make, don't make us feel bad for yeah. Them yeah, be like, <laughs> oh, we, we chose we the one. Pick a wrong barrel. Don't worry. Uh, That's true. They're all your babies, right? We're just <laughs> they're all pre-approved. There you go. So uh, I would say you think we could choose – what do you think, Ryan? Should we – if everybody chooses their top three or top four, what do you think? And then we, Man, we narrow it down to like the top three after that? I'm on – I'm on four. Well, if you narrow it down to three and then three, uh, we'd be at three. But um, So you're what, taking three barrels is what I'm hearing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you hey, don't, don't, don't put it past us. We, we <laughs> We've done it before. Yeah, I know. I was like, it's – it's just um, money after let's all. Let's go to four, and then we'll go from four to two. Okay, you want to do that? All right, so everybody choose their top four. I have four contenders, but I'm making it about me then. <laughs> yeah, you really so are. Every everybody else chime in. What, I was what like, I was like, we only got like 15 minutes left. Let's narrow it down a little quicker here. <laughs> okay, so what do you want to do? Narrow it down to one then? <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, then then we'll just have two that we'll know top two. Um, but what we'll do is let's narrow. I say everybody choose their top three. And then from there, we'll figure out what the top three or four are, and then we'll taste through those ones, and we'll choose our top two out of there. Cool? Okay. All right. So if uh, if 909 was in your favorites, raise your hand. Got a one there. All right. 931 was in your favorites. Raise a hand. I knew right. you'd like that one. Uh, why, why is that? It's just, it's got the Kenny Spice, like a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, nine, three, nine. Just me. Okay. Oh, wait, Shim as well. There as well. Okay. Nine, five, six. Ah, okay. Well, I think we're taking that one. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I tried that one on saturday and i was like i just picked one out of the box and i was like oh my gosh <laughs> this is really good all right uh nine seven two all right we got a trace there and nine seven three we got a two there. all right guys come on we got a three-way tie here <laughs> um so so 909's out we can we can we know that one and you know uh, we're picking 956. Yeah, so. 956 is uh, definitely an in. Yeah. So let's okay. So let's just take this down. So now we got four left, and we got to figure out which of these four do we want. So I'll tell you what. So we'll do this. Let's taste through 931, 939, 972, 973 one more time, and then you get one vote, and uh, we'll see That's if we are, and we'll see if there's just one that gets like two votes or three. So votes. it's. Sorry, right, 931. 931. Nine, three, nine, three, yep, 931, 939, 972, 973. Gotcha. And 956 is already in the winner category. Besides, we want to make sure we get you know the most of our samples here. <laughs> Whatever we don't drink tonight, I'll throw in my golf bag. These are perfect. Oh, darn. <laughs> these are yeah. perfect for a golf bag. These size. Kenny, did you say uh, 972 or 73 is the, uh, the other one? Both. Both. Okay. Yep. The color on these is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I should put that up there. It's it's a like a, a good rust mm -hmm. color. Amber. They have good maturity notes. Kenny calls it rust. They call it amber. Yeah. <laughs> we he have is... to try and make our thing sound a little bit more eloquent. So it looks like <laughs> rust. rust turns into amber. All right, we're from Kentucky. We don't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> looks like an old hubcap. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question on water. You guys were talking about water earlier. What's the difference or how does that affect it? Water in Kentucky versus Indiana versus Fort Collins versus anywhere else? Well, in Indiana and Kentucky are very similar. Uh, 
actually in, in uh, Lawrenceburg, uh, the reason that facility is where it's at, where it's at is it's actually located on top of a massive underground aquifer. So uh, it's all limestone filtered water, just like it is in Kentucky. <laughs> and it's uh, it, uh, an aquifer is, is basically a, a huge underground reservoir of water. And, and in Lawrenceburg, it stays 56 degrees year round. So it was uh, essentially an inexhaustible supply of, of 56 degree limestone filtered water. And we, we were using uh, 7 million gallons a day out of that aquifer. So uh, for Collins, uh, the same is true. You've got uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, Rocky Mountain water uh, is a resource uh, out there. And, it's all some of the best uh, water in the world for uh, brewing and distilling. So, yeah, you know that you have good water if you have a good concentration <laughs> of breweries and distilleries. Um, so, if you look at Fort Collins, for example, there's a reason CSU has a basically a brewing degree, and we have what like 23 breweries in town, I think. Um, so, anywhere you see those big clusters, you know that they have good water. You know, I used to just think limestone was in Kentucky. And then everyone uh, else that, uh, I'm just kidding, but it's funny how they hang their hat on. And then where were we, Kenny? We were in like in Georgia and they're like, yeah, look at this limestone spring. And you're like, wait a minute. I thought there was only <laughs> limestone in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're talking about their limestone water. And you're like, wait, don't you just use reverse osmosis yeah. to it all? It goes into everything. Like <laughs> you filter it all out anyway. So. Well, that's not true. Uh, you use the uh, you use the unfiltered water for uh, cooking and fermenting, which is very important. Uh, oh. but, then, but then once you take it uh, out of the barrel and put it in the bottle, then then you use the uh, uh, resin bed or the reverse osmosis to remove those uh, uh, minerals. But the, the minerals are a very big uh, uh, a very important factor for uh, cooking fermentation in the yeast uh, and the enzymes. So that, it's a big deal. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. That, know. that limestone filtered water is a real thing. Uh, ha having that calcium hardness <laughs> is a big plus for uh, yeast uh, and the enzymes. Uh, oh, very cool. Yeah, if you don't have them, sometimes you have to add them back just to make sure that your yeast are happy yeah. with the right fermentation. Glad Glad we keep those yeast happy and stress free. Sounds like yeah. absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Meditate, you know, get the sauna in, get some of the spa deep. a little bit. Yeah, so it's like keeping mama happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just give them plenty of sugar, right? Mm. Or I guess plenty of food to convert to sugar. I got that wrong. Well, I was thinking. I, I was thinking Valentine's Day is coming up, so you might be thinking flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and just so uh, everybody's wondering what the proofs on these that we're tasting, they're actually all uh, pretty much every single one of them is 112 proof, or actually 113 proof. I can't remember. I'm gonna say you're on. 115. Yeah, there's there's, there's between 112 and 113, but <laughs> I was I was about to say that the one we chose already for barrel 956 is actually 115 proof so i was gonna say i was like that's like the highest one and I, I, honestly your proof will jump um so it'll be higher than this when we actually bottle it that's the nog is thing, that 115.9 or 115.7 mm -hmm. that one was smooth I, I think that was one of the smoother ones the 956. see that's it's another crazy. great thing about the barrels is sometimes a barrel will show its proof a whole lot more than a barrel that's at like 122 proof. All right. So what, what's your entry proof on these then? Specific barrel. What's your entry proof on these? 120. Okay. So you're, you're, you're losing a few points then. Oh, cause MGP and the basically yeah. the nine feet of concrete in those warehouses. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. yeah. But what Kate was saying is once they get to Colorado, then they start going the other way. Oh. Quite a, very interesting dynamics. Is that more of uh, arid climate, I guess, or what is? It's. I think it's a combination of what pressure we're at, and then also um, how arid we are here in Colorado compared to Indiana and Kentucky. You guys are super humid compared to us, so I like to kind of think of it as osmosis because I'm a nerd. 
water wants to go where it's not. So in Kentucky, there's a lot of water in the atmosphere, a lot of water in the air. So it's cool to staying in the barrel here in Fort Collins. Water's like, got to get out. See ya. Mm. Water goes to the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. when, when you guys get your facility up and running, would the aging then convert over to uh, Fort Collins? Yep. Well, I, I think we're likely to uh, put humidity control in yeah. the, uh, the rick houses to limit angel share losses. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, put, the, put them the, in a the steam room. The, the altitude, I think uh, things will age faster uh, maybe than they do in uh, Kentucky or Indiana. But uh, I, I would say that humidity control will definitely be part of the rick houses just to limit the angel share losses because mm. of the are you, climate. are you guys at elevation as well or we're at about five thousand feet here in town yeah. mm -hmm. I, I used to work with a furniture company and we opened a store in denver and um we had to replace almost the entire store's uh, wood products about six months later because everything had cracked oh yeah, yeah. i believe it we're so dry here <laughs> i've never been more dehydrated during that that week in in denver mm -hmm. <laughs> Always drink your water. Yep. <laughs> like whenever we're doing tastings in town, people will, you know, finish their drink and I'll fill it up with water and they'll dump it. I'm like, you might want to drink it just to stay hydrated, you know. <laughs> That's a good plan. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Ace, okay. You mentioned uh, how the proof will jump up when you bottle it. What causes that or why is that? So um, one is that these were pulled probably last month. Um, and so between the time of when we pull the samples and when we bottle it, there's a chance that that proof will continue to jump up. And then um, the proof that's on these bottles also doesn't account for obscuration, which is just like the solid sugars in the whiskey. So we'll basically, we do a test where we evaporate all of the liquid and you just have those solids. Um, and then we account for that in the proof. Um, that'll always make it jump up a little bit. All right, I'm going between two right now. Me too. I got, I got mine. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> when you know, you know. I know. I know. We'll give it. We'll give it like one more minute, and then we'll come down to our decision. So we're creeping up on the edge of ten o'clock here. I know. I one of the four completely jumped into the lead for me. I gotta get up at four a.m. That's all right. Sleep's overrated. You can sleep on a plane. Yeah, I know. I have a daiquiri about 11. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, you'll be fine. There's just so much good caramel on these, too. Yeah. It's fun. I'm, I'm getting, like, different fruit notes and spice, and I'm so excited to see which one you all choose. I'm going with the fruitiest one, I think. <laughs> I love fruit. <laughs> right. I'm gonna have to look into getting an old elk uh, logo for my uh, for know. my drape. It looks there. Good right there. <laughs> you're gonna be like disappointed. When you look back. Like, oh, no, we sign no, off that's... here, and you turn around. You're like, oh, we're just back at home. It's just plain white. <laughs> See the yeah. Elk All is right. like my new favorite meat too. Gosh, I love that stuff. Wow. Oh, it's so good. I know. So Wish good. I could get it here more easy. Colorado like, oh, has a tasting room. Yeah. I know. <laughs> all these burgers and elk like, broth. online orders. Elk Is that what you y'all serve? Like elk burgers and elk brats in the tasting room? Mm -hmm. oh, we God. do. Not me. Oh wow. We're flying we have out a next really time. great chef. Actually, the best is probably the elk pot pie. Oh, oh man, it's heaven. It is so so good. And then like bourbon bread pudding to end the night. Oh, oh that's my love language. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I'll, yeah, elk's like my new favorite thing. And are you folks up? All right. <laughs> Do any of you hunt? Is what he asked. Sorry, yeah, what yeah, basically, if you have a hundred spaceship from Colorado, we have plenty of them for you. That's yeah. Hard. Plenty of elk. Oh, we have the biggest turn in the biggest turn in North America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotta it's pay funny. like thirty dollars for a ribeye. <laughs> <to get it laughs> Dude, 
<laughs> you should like look up videos of like the Colorado elk herds because a lot of people across the country don't always know what an elk looks like, what an elk is. Um, and then if you show them like the video of this massive herd over like rolling hills and then crossing the road and stuff, yeah, freak out a little. It's super cool. <laughs> I've seen them at Bass Pro Shop stuffed. Uh, yeah, they're like animals. <laughs> they're huge. All right, everybody. It's decision time. Y'all got your favorite? I got mine. All right. So we had four of them here. All right. So if 931 was your favorite, speak up. All right. 939 was your favorite. Raise it up. Just me. All right. Well. Loser. Something tells me I'm going to lose this one. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Poor Kenny. Yeah, well, it's, he uh, never wins. This is this is the this is the fun part about doing these. It's 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 up to the community and up to everybody to decide. So, all right, nine seven two. All right. Well, I guess that calls it nine seven three is the winner then, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> the three is nine. I flipped on nine right. seven three. I had it in dead last and, almost. And even and even Greg raised his hand up there, so we'll just go to put an extra mark there. All yeah, right, so there we go. Fun. This one reminds me of the Nog, I think. So let's, let's compare. I think 73, 73 has more depth to it than, than the 72 that I liked. 72 was smoother, but 73 has more going on. Yeah, it's got that. It's got like those little raisin syrup kind of thing going on at the end, like some fruits popping out. Oh yeah, I get like dates, molasses, yeah, like cinnamon finish. Yeah, it's like a cinna raisin cinnabon. Yeah, from the ball, you just like gain ten pounds. I gotta say, both <laughs> of these are both of these are competing with Nog. Oh uh, yeah, nine five six and uh, seventy three. It's my only empty glass. <laughs> yeah. My nine five six is smoke, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so is. Uh, nine seven three yeah they were they were all great so you know as we start wrapping this up you know uh, by the way everybody that's on here just make sure you stay on before we end the broadcast but i do want to say thank you to kate and greg for joining us tonight as well as cody and dave for being a part of this community and and being a part of this and making this decision a lot easier because it was up to me i'd be like oh yeah we're we're taking nine three nine all day but hey <laughs> Came, it came down to it. It takes uh, uh, six more people to keep you in check. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Some, somebody's got to make sure I get put back in my place, and that's okay. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's not a problem. But, again, thank you all for, for coming on, uh, being a part of this. Again, taking time away from your family to, to come and drink some whiskey and hang out with us. It was always a pleasure, and, and definitely thank you for doing that. And for anybody that's watching – uh, if you want to learn more about how you get your hands on these bottles, how do you be like Cody and Dave and actually be here and help select barrels, you can go to bourbonpursuit.com and there will be a link at the very top that says Private Barrel Club. And you can get all the information on how you can get access to everything that we select. As I mentioned, in 2020, we did 40 barrels. This year, I mean, we might do 40. I mean, we're doing five this week, so we're off to a pretty good start already. But We'll uh, we'll see we'll see what that that's gonna entail. Uh, I don't know if I want to do more than forty. Miles. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if I want to do more than forty. <laughs> it was like, it was a lot. That last was a year. lot. It really was. It really was. But uh, make sure you go and you can go and check out our private barrel club. Not only to get access to to this, but you help support the podcast. You help support everything that Ryan and I do for putting out a, a bunch of great content, great guests, and and just good bourbon knowledge and. People like Greg and Kate that get to come on and, and just drop knowledge bombs all day on people. So it, it's great to, to have that. And you also get first access to anything released as a part of the Pursuit series as well. So don't forget about that. And speaking of that, Ryan, did you check uh, Sealbox inventory by any chance today? Nope. Fill me in. We broke. We are less than 50 bottles remaining on Sealbox for Pursuit United. So wow. we sent 650 bottles there, or sorry, 690, and we're less than 50 remaining. So that's that's, that's sold in uh, six weeks of what that's taken. So uh, if you are looking for something else that's unique, interesting, and you can get it shipped to your state, so go and check that out. Uh, PursuitSpirits.com. 
that's the last plug I'll give for that. But I do want to say thank you, everybody, for for coming and joining us here tonight. We had almost 60 people at one point tuning in to watch this. Uh, a bunch of people sitting around drinking whiskey. It's always fun. But again, this is always back to the community. And thank you all for being a part of this and helping Ryan and I just help select great barrels and be able to get good whiskey in your hands. And yep, thanks to do it without you. Yep, and thanks to Greg and Kate for making good whiskey for us. That's, that's what it's all about. Thank you for having us. Much this appreciated. Awesome. Yeah, we love it. All Keep right. Keep it coming. Well, cheers, everybody, and make sure you stay tuned to all of our social channels. Where we'll post any time that we'll be doing a live barrel selection. We'll also post it to our Patreon community as well, and you'll know when we're doing our next ones. All right, cheers, everybody. Have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon.